Welcome to part 2 of my Analyzing WannaCry series. If you haven't watched part 1, you can find the link on the screen and in the description. Now before we dive in, let's quickly recap. In the last video, we looked at the WannaCry executable. When it starts, it first tries to access the kill switch URL. If that succeeds, WannaCry will simply quit. Next, it creates a service called Microsoft Security Center, which simply points to the WannaCry executable. Afterwards, it writes the embedded resource 1831 to C Windows taskSkeExe and runs it with the slash i argument. Looking into taskSkeExe, it first checks whether it was launched with the slash i argument, and if yes, it will create a hidden directory in C program data and copy itself into it. Then it will create a service and launch the hidden copy. This copy will now be launched without the slash i argument, and the first thing it does is extract the integrated and encrypted resources. This gives us a lot of .wnry files, two .exe files, and translations into a lot of languages. That's where we stopped in the first part, so let's go into Ghidra and continue reversing taske.exe. Also, all files and even the Ghidra project for this video will be linked in the description. So here in Ghidra, we see the function that we know from part one, which extracted the integrated resources using the strange password. The next function in the file is the Bitcoin something function, and in it we can see three Bitcoin addresses. So let's name the variable accordingly. We also see some strange local arrays, and often if you have two local arrays back to back, they are actually one array. So let's merge them and see if the decompilation makes a bit more sense. Let's call this unknown Bitcoin array. Next, let's jump into the function under our Bitcoin addresses, and we can see that the first thing it does is check parent two and compare it to zero. If it is zero, the mode variable is set to a constant. And if we check the constant in the listing, we can see that the two constants are just strings that were not recognized correctly. RB and WB, the read binary and write binary flags for fopen. Now, next we see the c.runacry file being opened in the specified mode. If the mode is read, we read the contents of c.runacry into param1. If the mode is write, we write the contents of param1 into c.runacry. Going back, we see that if the read was successful, a random number is generated, and that random number is used to select a random Bitcoin address, which gets copied into the array in which we just read our c.wannacry. Afterwards, the changed c.wannacry is written back to the file system. So let's call this function select and write Bitcoin address. Back in the main function, we see two commands being run that set the directory to hidden and grant some permissions. The next function simply initializes function pointers, just as we saw before. Back in the main, let's look at this next function, and it looks quite strange. The decompiler had a hard time making sense of this. And if we go into the next function, we see something very interesting. The calling convention is marked as this call, and the first argument is avoid this. We are looking at C++ code. Now a great tool to make more sense out of C++ code automatically is OOAnalyzer from the Pharos tools. It will try to reconstruct classes and can be super helpful, and it comes with a Ghidra plugin. To run OO Analyzer, I'm using their Docker image, so I just pull it, start the container, and run OO Analyzer with the JSON output option on our 1831 binary. After just a minute, we have a JSON file that we can import into Ghidra. And it worked! The strange function became a constructor, and the local variable an instance of a class, which we can also find in the symbol tree. Beyond the constructor, we also see the deconstructor at the end of the function. Sweet! Let's call this class instance main class, just because we are in the main and it makes it a bit more readable. Let's check out the method OOAnalyzer created. You can see it taking our main class, a null string, and two zeros as arguments. Going into the method, we see a call to another method, taking a member of our main class and the first parameter as argument. Jumping into it, we immediately see the crypt import key invocation, but also another class method earlier. This method just acquires a crypto context, so let's rename the class member to crypto provider and name the function acquire crypto context. Going back, we see that if the acquisition was successful and the first argument is zero, crypt import key is called with a global buffer as its argument. Looking in the listing, we can see that the global buffer is actually a Microsoft RSA key blob, so let's call this RSA key. We also see that this key is imported into a member of our class, so let's call that member RSA key. Now, if param1 was not null, we go into this function which takes the crypto provider, the RSA key member, and param1. Looking into it, we can see that param3 is used as a file name. 
The method tries to read the provided file name and then tries to import the red data as an RSA key. So let's call this import key from file. Going back, we now have a good idea of what this function does. So let's call it import key from file or integrated, as it either imports a key from a file or uses the integrated RSA key. The method at the end simply destroys the keys if something goes wrong and releases the crypto context. Let's also make a quick note that our import key function returns 1 on success and 0 on failure. Going in the parent function, let's fix up some of the types and call this function import RSA key. Back in main, if the import was successful, we see another class method being invoked. This one takes our main class and also a string containing t.wnry as its argument. Let's jump into it and we can immediately see param1 again being used as a file path. If the file exists, the size of the t.wannacry file is read and stored into local28, so let's call it file size. Afterwards, 8 bytes are read from the file and then compared to the string wannacry exclamation mark. So we will call this header 8 as it's 8 bytes long. Next, 4 bytes are read into a local integer variable. If they are equal to 0x100 or 256 in decimal, the function continues to read 256 bytes from t.wannacry into our class. The next 4 bytes from the file are read and completely ignored. Then 8 bytes are read and treated further down as an argument to global alloc, so this is probably a 64-bit integer. Now we see this method, which takes one of the main class members and the 256 bytes from t.wannacry we just read. This method tries to decrypt the 256 bytes we provided using the RSA key we loaded earlier. On success, it also memcopies the data into the buffer provided in the third argument and copies the decrypted size into the fourth argument. We'll call this method decrypt with RSA key and jump back. The next method call is kind of strange. There's a lot of stuff going on and we can see some XOR and so on. Not really obvious what this is. The same is kind of true for the next function. Now we know that often XOR will be some kind of encryption. So let's run a script that tries to find common crypto constants. You can find it in my Ghidra scripts repository. And once we run it, we can see that it found some CSC32 constants and also some IES constants. Perfect. The script will create bookmarks at the address of those constants. So let's name both the constants and also call all the function that reference them AES something. If we now go back into the function that parses t.wannacry, we see that indeed the first strange function is some AES implementation. And as it's the first call to AES, it's probably the key setup. Going into the second function, we can see that it also calls out to some AES functions, so it might also be part of the AES implementation. Now looking back a bit, it looks like one of the arguments to the AES function is the data we just decrypted and the last argument to the AES call is 0x10, so 16 bytes or 128 bits. Is this maybe using our just decrypted bytes as AES key? We can also see that after this suspected AES initialization, a buffer large enough to hold the entire t.wannacry file is allocated and the rest of the file is read into our class. Are we maybe decrypting the contents of t.wannacry here? Let's fix up the rest of the function and then we try to rebuild this decryption. To rebuild the decryption, I copied the RSA key embedded in the binary into a separate file called rsakey.bin. I also used dd to extract the 256 bytes and the rest of the t.wannacry file into two separate files. To fully reconstruct what's happening, I wrote this small piece of code which does exactly what the binary would do. It loads the key data, in this case from a file called rsakey.bin, acquires a crypto context and then tries to import the loaded data as an RSA key. Next, it opens and reads the extracted 256 bytes before trying to decrypt them using the just initialized RSA key. If we run it, we get this nice hex dump and luckily no errors. Let's copy the first 16 bytes, which we will use as AES key, and create a short Python script which takes the key from the hex dump, uses an IV of 0, and then simply initializes the AES cipher and tries to decrypt the large chunk of t.wannacry with it. 
Let's go to a terminal and run the script. I simply called it decryptlargechunk.py. Successful execution should create a largechunk.dec file, and indeed, it's there. Now, if we run file on largechunk.dec, we can see that we just decrypted a DLL. Interesting. Now, this was a lot of stuff. Let's look at what exactly we just did. So, we were looking at taskk.exe, which was processing the contents of t.wannacry, which we got by extracting the encrypted resources embedded in taskk.exe. Next, we found an RSA key in taskk.exe and loaded 256 bytes from t.wannacry. We used the RSA key to decrypt these 256 bytes and got an AES key. This AES key, combined with the rest of t.wannacry, resulted in a DLL. Going back into main, we can see the decrypted DLL is then given into a function, the return value of which is given into another function with the argument task start. These functions simply load the DLL and call into it. Time for a quick summary. We saw that taskEXE writes the randomly selected Bitcoin address to c.wannacry. Then it loaded the integrated RSA key, it decrypted some parts of t.wannacry using that key, and finally used the resulting AES key to decrypt and run the DLL embedded in t.wannacry. Let's load that DLL into Ghidra. After loading the DLL into Ghidra, and I also already ran OO Analyzer and imported the result, we can see that the DLL exports two functions, entry and task start. As we just saw a task start in task exe, let's start there. Now, to save some time, I already named a lot of this stuff in this file. If you want to explore it on your own, you can find the Ghidra project in the description. The first thing task start does is create a mutex. If that fails, task start returns. Next, it parses its module path and changes the current working directory to the directory in which taskk.exe is. Afterwards, we see a function that we are familiar with, read write c.wannacry, which in this case simply reads c.wannacry into a global buffer. If that was successful, a global variable is set to indicate whether the DLL is running with system permissions. The next function we also already know, init function pointers and init crypto function pointers, which just load function pointers to some functions we will need later. If that was successful, we create three strings a times zero dot rest dot pky and dot eky. We again try to get a mutex and if that was successful we go into a function that is quite interesting, so let's take a look inside. Now this function first generates a 000 dot dky string and checks if a file with that name exists. If yes, it also checks if a dot pky file exists. If both exist, it goes into this function. We can see some test data strings being handled, then the acquisition of a crypto context, and then the pky file being imported as a key, and the dky file being imported as a key. After some more string copying, we can see that the test data is encrypted using the pky key, and then attempted to be decrypted by the dky key. If that was successful, the input of the encryption and the output of the decryption are checked on whether they are identical, and the function returns 1 if yes. So this looks like the check whether we can decrypt data, and if we go back into task start, the if clause will go to its negative branch if the decryption was successful. Let's assume we don't have a DKY file yet and follow what else is going on. We see allocation and construction of a class, but nothing interesting happens here. Next there is a function which takes a class, the PKY and the EKY path as its arguments. Going into it, we again see the acquisition of a crypto context and further down the loading of an embedded RSA key if no PKY argument was provided. If the pky path was provided, as is the case for us, the function tries to import a key from the pky file. If that failed, a key that is stored in the DLL is loaded into key 2. Next, a new key pair is generated into key 1, the public key of which is exported to the .pky path. Afterwards, in the next method, the private key of our generated key is encrypted using the public key from the binary and written to the eky file. This is the generation of encryption and decryption keys of the ransomware, and we can see that the private key that we probably need to save our files is being encrypted by an attacker-provided public key. Going back into the main, we find a function that simply loads the contents of the .res file into memory. If the .res file didn't exist or is empty, the global buffer is filled with 8 bytes of random data. Finally, we see 5 threads being created. The first thread only runs if the global data, which is pointed to here, is equal to zero, and then writes the current time into the global .res file buffer. It then writes the contents of the .res buffer to the file system. Then a pause of roughly 25 seconds is made before repeating the whole thing. 
Now at the end of this function we see the call to exit thread, which should terminate the thread. However, Ghidra kept decompiling whatever came afterwards. To fix this, we can edit the function signature and simply set the no return attribute, which will clean up our decompilation massively. The next thread checks every 5 seconds whether the decryption file exists and works. If that was successful, a global status variable is set which will notify the other threads. Now, the other threads we will look at in part 3, especially the encryption component, should be quite interesting. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments or send me a question on Twitter. Thanks and see you on this channel again soon.